Michael Anderley, welcome to Behind the Fiction. Hello, Steve. How are you doing today? I am well. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> We're here today to talk about something that you have been alluding to in your author notes recently, um, a secret project that, I, as I understand it, has been going on for quite some time. It, it has been going on for quite some time. It's actually well over a year in contemplation, and uh, we're over a year now in the efforts to start it going. It, um, it, it's been interesting because it's a, uh, what I would call a tinpole project, and oftentimes when I talk to authors, I talk about passion projects, and this is one of those projects which is part uh, wanting and part passion. Okay, so first let's define tentpole project. <laughs> a tentpole project is for companies something that, um, you know, whenever you put up the tentpoles in America, uh, you have the massive, the one in the middle, the one that actually pushes everything out. And mm -hmm. so it's the tallest, it's the one in the center. And Cuthering Gambit can be looked at as a tentpole project for LMBPN, certainly in the beginning. Um, we have Unbelievable Mr. Brownstone would be another example one. And now Opus X is taking the next step in this, but it is doing it in a different fashion. Usually LMBPN does tentpole projects considering, you know, how many books we're going to put out, what are the characters. And in this one, we started differently because the vision started with the concept, but we wanted the art first. Mm -hmm. We had the ideas of what the stories would be about, but I wanted to confirm that we could create a a world uh, described as richly as we wanted. And from there, we were able to meet um, the individuals that helped create that world at an event that Jasmine Walt put on in Boston last year. And so when you talk about the the people who are, are creating the world, these are artists of, of different types, filmmakers, That's correct. Um, graphic artists, et cetera, et cetera. Correct. Correct. I'm going to make you ask the question. Are we are we talking about who who these people are? <laughs> we are talking about who they are. I just uh, it, I have to give my little bit of, uh, of humor everywhere I can with you. So in this, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm the only one that's going to think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, everybody will. Oh, okay. Your laugh is infectious. So uh, Gene Malika Studios. We mm -hmm. met them last year at the Boston Fantasy Fest. And I think it was like end of May, might have been end of April, end of May sometime. And seeing the different products that they had brought out, I was intrigued to start working with them. And they have studios or they're based on the East Coast out of New York City and that area and that environment. And so we started talking with them, including uh, things that we had learned when we had done models for the Curthier and Gambit mm -hmm. and narrowing down who and what we wanted to do and what was the world itself, including a future-based, somewhat ghost-in-the-shell, cyberpunk. You know, I just had that feel of what I wanted. And I wanted to be able to um, use a little bit of the of both the knowledge that we had gained to date, but also our investment in something that was going to be much bigger than what we normally would do. You mentioned earlier that this was a sort of a passion project for you. Um, yes. But it, now you're describing something that is visual rather than, you know, the, you're, you're, the early stages of this were designing the world, designing uh, images, things like that. So was that a, a big part of your of the passion for this project? Absolutely. It's um, the interesting part for me is that I, I do get a lot of uh, excitement, but also ideas from visuals. And there are a lot of times that we will write a book and then we go back and ask the artist to try to mimic what we've written. Well, this time I wanted to tell part of the story and have the visuals up front for what we were going to do. And in order to accomplish it, I had a desire for something that was getting closer to Hollywood production levels on an itty-bitty budget. <laughs> and so... <laughs> <laughs> I want my cake and I want to eat it. <laughs> and so it took a while for us to go through and uh, confirm that it could be done, that the, the uh, opportunity was there, the capability was there, the technology was there for us to see this vision into the future. 
it's it's said before that you have three parts to every triangle. You have time, you have money, and you have quality. You can only have two of them. <laughs> so um, we wanted the quality. We didn't necessarily have the Hollywood budget, or there's no necessarily. We have no Hollywood budget, <laughs> so we had to give it time. And that's why it took us close to a year to get what we have doing and going so that as we bring the books out, um, you know, we have all of this behind us, what we're trying to accomplish. And how did you how did you describe this project when you first started talking to people about it? Did you describe it the way you would describe a book or did you describe it the way you might talk about something else? Um, I'll, I'll actually tell you how. It worked out with Gene Malika. I, I um, asked Judith, uh, the, the marketing officer in the company, to get involved and actually help describe what's going on. And she created um, a paper that included snippets from different movies. So mm -hmm. Blade Runner. Blade Runner, the first one. Blade Runner 2049, I think, or 2048. And um, Ghost in the Shell. And a few other movies to understand what the visuals were that we were trying to get across. I understood that I wanted something that um, harkened back to a little bit of the Foundation series, and which is Isaac Asimov, and the fact that you had somebody who is out on the frontier and somebody who is, you know, on the home planet, and it is a situation of two rebels, you know, whose worlds collide, and the story of how that's going about inside of what I think of is uh, an exciting world, you know, one where you have personal flitters that can fly. And the different situations that go on there, where you have one city, which we call Neo SoCal, which has been rebuilt. And, you know, there are different aspects of it. So if you go back to, say, Fifth Element, when you know that if you go to the very bottom, that's the worst part of what's going on. The pollution settles down there. Um, but you have different rich environments, not necessarily or always from when you go something, uh, let's say, you know, 250 miles south. But you can go three miles down and have a completely different experience, which for us here now, you know, on Earth, that's true in a few places on Earth that you can accomplish this. So is Neo SoCal like a character in in the series? Is the location does the location become a character, so to speak? It it does actually, in a way. the The concept is that the story is in the future. Mankind has changed pol some political. Uh, situations partially due to terrorism and uh, unfortunately a large swath of the West Coast uh, Southern California is destroyed and in doing so it changes what what the governments have to focus on and in doing so actually uh, America if you can imagine I mean California means a lot to America and to have half of California wiped out is uh, a major undertaking and in order to, you know america is always going to go back and they're going to find out who did this and, and they're going to bring uh, a certain justice to the situation and in this case the chinese government were the ones who helped locate and helped bring it down because this type of terrorism who's willing to accomplish what they did is harmful to the whole world period you know there, there's no question on that one and then also we're going out into the stars I'm a big believer that um, it isn't necessarily governments that are going to be the biggest uh, challenges in the future. It's going to be global companies where it's not the company itself that's necessarily a problem, but the individuals in the companies. And so some of them could go rogue. And how are you going to tell if you're a big, large company with 1,400 different subsidiaries, which one of them is, is not being on the right track? I happen to be at Worldcon right now in Dublin, Ireland. And there was a uh, talk related to that AIs already exist and they're actually corporations, not a computer. And I thought that was an interesting mm -hmm. aspect because mm -hmm. what it means is the actual thinking parts of the corporation are humans. And when you get an aggregate of humans, you get an artificial intelligence. Interesting. You, we, so we've described the world. We've described sort of a time frame. Um, I'm curious – did you create the characters first, or I mean, I, I know the motivations for the characters would have come first, but um, I know, and I, you mentioned models earlier. So, did the characters come first in your mind, or did the models become the characters that that you had envisioned in your mind? That's a good question because it is a little bit of both. For example, 
We do a lot, and I mean a lot of stories and series and universes within LMPN. So we're creating new characters. We're constantly creating new milieus. And one of the things that happens is that you get familiar with a certain trope, and you do it as well. So we do a lot of uh, female first characters or mm -hmm. stories, and in this case, uh, it wasn't female first or male first. It was it was a, a joint effort. So both of them, to some degree, each have the same outcome they want, but they go about it differently. The lady in here, I wanted not to be a, a, a white woman. You know, there's I've got plenty of those characters. And I wanted someone, however, that does still represent the concept of the United States, which is a melting pot of individuals. And in Southern California, uh, we have a home there. We've lived there before. There are – there's pretty much everybody. <laughs> I mean it doesn't matter. There's someone there. And I wanted someone that represented a more uh, Asian or Sinophone, um experience for the leading character. And then for the guy, I actually wanted something which is not accurate. I wanted something to be an older leading man. And in order to accomplish it, though, there needed to, I needed to be able to bring him back to younger. And so I had to create and change the story to match this. So it was interesting how Gene and the company could start somebody. And, you know, we, we gave little hints to the fact that he is older in the first books. And by the last books, he looks younger. And so it's just a little bit, maybe something you're familiar with, Steve. I don't know. Yeah. I, I am familiar with looking older. I haven't reached the looking younger stage yet. So I, I, I'm anxious to read these books and, and figure out how that works. <laughs> lots of money. <laughs> lots and lots of money. <laughs> okay. Um, you mentioned books. Lots of books. So what, what's the expected length of the series? We are going 12 books, which is something that we have – um, kind of pulled down on based on the fact that we do, you know, 15 to 20, 25 books a month. And so we do very long series and typically, however, one change is that our book series are usually about 70,000 words. This case, they're 120,000 words. So they're much longer than what we would typically do. And in order to accomplish this, plus the amount of time that we've been working on it, you know, we're, we're having a backlog of the books as we're pulling them together and we're writing them. And so, um, will be starting November 1st is the actual release. November, Should I? yeah, Obsidian Detective, uh, November 1st, 2019. <laughs> be there. 2019, <laughs> that's right, be here. Actually, though, but what, what do we have here? I'll be the interviewer for a second. What do we have already out there, Steve, for the fans who are listening to this? Well, we have the pre-orders for um, the first two books are out on Amazon. The first seven books are out wide. Um, six. Six books are out wide. Thank you for clarifying that. And um, so, yeah, and, and probably by the time this airs, we'll have all six books at, at Amazon as well. It's a little bit more of a process to get um, pre-orders a ways in advance uh, published at Amazon. But this is different than the typical, the, the Michael Anderley that everyone knows and loves, which is write the book, publish it. Write the book, yes. publish it. Write the book, publish it. The whole rapid release, that's, there's a lot of science and research behind um, how long you like to, to space books. And this is something different. It is. I mean, we'll, we'll, in the next discussion that we go into, we'll talk a little bit about um, the distribution. But the, the timing of the books is different because we're doing something we have not planned before. And that is... The audios for all of the books will come out simultaneous with the books. And when you do that, and we have a partner who's already signed up with us, and we're really happy um, to be able to talk to them and talk about them. But they need, what, two months yeah, it takes to make time. sure that <laughs> – It takes time to make that, to make that all work. <laughs> so when we wanted to put out the audio, the paperback, and the ebook all simultaneously, you have to have it done in advance. And once you do it in advance, you break my – um, my need to hit the publish button. It's kind of like when I hit the end or anybody brings me, um, you know, their book, I'm like, okay, we have the book in hand. Can I hit publish yet? No. <laughs> how about now? No. Okay. How about now? <laughs> so since I can't do it anyway, I'm having to learn how to accomplish the whole patience thing, which I'm really horrible at. <laughs> 
and and maybe that's the reason that you needed a, a almost a year to plan this out just to get yourself ready for the patients thing because I'm 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 just waiting for the can we move the pre order up what can we do to, what can we do to release this book today. <laughs> I think our our partners, of which there are many, would crucify me or yes. burn me or whatever. <laughs> you mentioned partners, and and we'll get into that in a in a future episode. This is not just a uh, a Michael Anderley thing. There are a lot of people involved yeah. in this. We mentioned Gene Molokai Studios. There are a lot of other people involved, and a lot of other companies involved in in the, the launch of this series. So I think that will be fascinating for listeners when we get to that point. Um, you and I had talked about the idea of simultaneous releases for uh, ebook and audio in the past, and I did not have an argument that would convince you to do it because your response was always, "I want to get the book published." <laughs> we can't wait. How can we get the audio book? Can we get the audio book done in a day? Because then I'd be willing to wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. So you get your wish. You win. You win, Steve. Yeah, and and we'll and we'll we'll see. Um, you know, I'm I'm really excited to see how the audio does, and and we're super excited with the audio partner that we have for this. Uh, I mean, this whole yes. thing is why why the you're not you're you're pretty much an open book. You write your author notes at the back of every book. You travel around the world and speak at conferences. You don't have a lot of secrets. Why? Why a secret project? I think part of it is because I there was a little bit of fear in the beginning. It wouldn't meet my hope for expectations. You know, when when I'm looking at it and I want, for example, a little video. Uh, one of the characters, for those that know me, they know that I like to do things in sets of three, three characters in the beginning. Three of this, three of that, three attributes about the character that you might know about. And um, one of them is the car, for instance. And we'll have a reveal for the car. But I, in my mind, could see the car going through one of these cities, one of these cyberpunk sort of concepts. And that's not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to you know, wait because I wanted my own car. I didn't want to go. I mean, we've done a lot of things at LMBPN. We've um, our 3D assets. We're very familiar with using them. We've done items for the zoo series where we've put um, 3D assets into a game engine in order to create videos. Uh, a lady that was built uh, a 3D model for Kiara Freya with a video going around and around and her looking around. I mean, we've done some pretty amazing things, but that wasn't to the level that I was looking for with with the Opus X. And so with the car itself, I looked at some of the different concepts that Judith had provided Jean Malika and his team. And I'm like, I want my own 3D car. <laughs> and so when you say something like that, A, it's not going to be built overnight because you don't go to a 3D asset and you just say that one, you know. Mm -hmm. You actually start building it and you go, no, nah, that front end doesn't work. No, nah, that back end doesn't work. Well, where how does the... How does the car function from a stand, standard of anti-gravity or um, just being able to push it around in the air? Or how would it turn? Or can our models be put into the car? You know, all of these assets have to be created before you do the actual photo shoot of the model so that you know what you're getting into. And so I, uh, I, I didn't want to say anything until I'm like, yeah, that is way cool. This is meeting the aspect of my passion project so that I'd be willing to admit more. So I don't think you guys would note about in the company for four or five months. Uh, if I remember correctly, we had a, a company get together in September of last year mm -hmm. and that was the first y'all saw it. Yeah. And that obviously that's almost a year ago. That's 11 months ago. So this has been going on for maybe 16 months. Yeah, at least. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and the first thing we saw was a brochure mm -hmm. and i just remember my reaction to that being oh my gosh this is really cool <laughs> <laughs> and we'll talk about that brochure in a in a future episode so th there's a lot of branding that's going that's going into the opus x series for the various books 
um, and uh, some of the elements inside the books. And we'll get into all of that. We're going to have a series of these talks between Michael and I where we we sort of just lay out the Opus X story and, and, this, and the story of the books and the partners and all of that over the course of uh, really leading up to the launch on November 1st. But um, you have described this as not just a book launch, but essentially a launch for 12 books. You know, we're not, this Correct. is not a single launch on November 1st. This is going to be a process. Uh, the process of launching this series is going to go on for all 12 books. See, that's an interesting, so um, at first I was like, what are we going to talk about where we don't talk about everything for 25 minutes? And here's here's one aspect of that. I have talked about it as being an 18-month launch. So, and that actually has to go back to the whole trad pub and everything else that we're doing. And we'll talk about why distribution in the next discussion. But one of the things that goes back into history of books and, and publishing them is that normally they have a, a yearly time. <laughs> Look yeah. at us. Yeah. And when they do that, they, the, the purpose of the, the year-long lead time is also to get bookstores excited so that bookstores will pre-order the products so that the book is there on day one in order for them that, you know, thousands and thousands of books to be purchased. It gets the New York Times. And if nothing works exactly as planned, then everything's done in just a few weeks and the book goes to the back. You know, many of them get shipped back. And so there are different aspects of that. Well, we are not a traditional publisher. You know, it's it's like right here, you know, we're disruptive imagination. And so one of the aspects has to do with the business side of things. And we are looking at it as and know from our history of what we've done. We've you know, we have 600 plus titles in our in our archive. We've done this a couple of times and we've made mistakes, you know, but we know that there's a lot that is new that we need to do. And we haven't been wide. We've tried wide a couple of times. And we kind of tipped our toe in the water, got our foot wet. We understand more about what's going on. But in order for us to truly become a publisher that can handle both Amazon exclusivity as well as wide, we have to be able to put the money and the time and the effort, and that's a minimum of six to nine months. And the only way for us to accomplish it is to do it big. Mm -hmm. you know. And so for us to do it, we have a very specific release schedule. Every six weeks, there will be a new book. Every six weeks, there will be a new book. I'm already editing book two. You know, we haven't delivered book one to our partners, and I'm editing book two right now. And, you know, our goal is that uh, we'll be a book to two books ahead of schedule so that if anything happens, that's not going to be a big hiccup to us. And so each, each six weeks, we want a release, book four. Uh, one of our collaborators, Craig Martell, has a saying, nothing sells the first book mm -hmm. like the latest book. And that is something we're going to be testing on the wide scenario, which is every six weeks we're going to have a new campaign to remind people this is an amazing series. Why don't you get on track with us before the end <laughs> and you know, catch up? We understand who our core audience is. You know, readers who love to be involved in stories and love to see rich worlds and a tapestry of characters that they enjoy being with. And we hope to bring it to them every six weeks like clockwork, no matter if they're an audio, a paperback, or an ebook reader. All right. So that's a great place to wrap this up. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We will be back in another week or so uh, with another update on the Opus X project. Oops.